for this day we're gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with you you're the reason we're here
Christ be magnified in me. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, as I stand before you this morning in fear and trembling, uh, about to launch into this brand new series on the family, I uh, find myself more nervous and uh, anxious about doing a series on the family or on marriage than probably any other subject I teach on. And I'm not fully sure why. It could have to do with uh, the one that lets me know if I'm doing good at marriage or not sitting in the front row here this morning, about the time I think, man, I am really doing good at this whole husband thing. She reminds me I'm not. And uh, um, I, I, as we step into this this morning, I also would say I, I stand before you with great anticipation. I believe that we have an opportunity in our marriages and in our homes to display the goodness and the transformation of Jesus Jesus Christ in our lives than with any other relationship. Mainly because no other relationship in our life has the access to us that our spouse does or our children do or children our parents do. And I I learned this principle years ago in studying for uh, a marriage series that whenever we learn that marriage is not designed uh, expressly for our happiness, but rather for our holiness, it transforms our entire approach to marriage. Because if, if all we're looking at it is, well, I'm not, because people will do this. They'll come and, Pastor, we need some marriage counseling. Okay, well, what's wrong? I'm not happy. I, I used to, at some point or another, would say, well, well, tell me about that. Now, I've came up with a much more biblical expression. Well, la-ti-da. It's not designed expressly for your happiness, but it is designed and given to us for the Lord to work out His holiness in our life. No other relationship on earth gives us more opportunity to be kind, compassionate, long-suffering, I'll get to that later, than does the marriage or uh, the relationship with our children or our parents. So this morning, as we look here in our our text, we want to look at this idea of family life. Ephesians 5, stand with me if you would to honor the reading of the Word. I'm just going to go through verse 7 this morning. Ephesians 5, if you found it, say amen. The Bible says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness or foolish talking or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, I want you to listen to this. This you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things... The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Lord, speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. If there is one thing I think that we could all come to an agreement on in here this morning is that when it comes to the issue of family life, it's not always easy. Would y'all agree with that statement? It's not always gee whiz and hallelujah. It's not always kind. It's not always compassionate. Sometimes it could resemble more of a war zone than a playground. And one of the reasons I think that this is is that we tend to live very isolated and idealistic lives whenever it comes to the issue of family. And one of the things that contributes to that is that the, 
the benchmarks that we try to hit or the, the models that we see are those that we um, look at and observe through the lenses of social media. We say, what do you mean by that? Well, have you ever noticed that uh, it's really rare that whenever you and your sweetheart or you and your children are having these uh, intense moments of fellowship, you're, 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 you're just about ready to end one another. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm going to kill her until God she died kind of thing, okay? Like, we're, I mean, we're locked up and it's, it's bad. Have you ever noticed how folks don't just say, you know, there, there's no man, and right in the middle of that, just pauses, gets his phone out and say, hey, smile, and takes a picture of her and puts it on there and say, look how mean she is. If he did, it'd only be one time, amen? The next picture would be with him without a couple of teeth. But what do we do? We wait for those moments of bliss, right? We wait for those moments whenever um, mama's doing something wonderful and she's all pretty, not a hair out of place, got paint on the barn. And that, y'all all right? You know you girls paint the barn. Everything's glorious. You take that picture and you put it's 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 glamour shots from the eighties. Amen. Y'all remember? How many of y'all old people remember that? Okay. Amen. Glamour shots. That's right. And, and so that's what you put on there. We take pictures of a of dad and and well, what pictures of dad do we put on there? The ones where he's actually doing something other than sitting in his chair playing with his belly button, right? I mean, ain't nobody taking a picture of dad sitting in his chair. Uh, with a Cheeto sticking out of his belly button saying, that's my knight in shining armor. But it's always with dad, those sentimental moments whenever he's you know, playing with the children or he's expounding on Deuteronomy with them. Oh, what a godly man. We, we give this facade that speaks a language that says, man, everything is hunky-dory, it's beautiful in our homes. Now, again, what I'm not advocating this morning, so don't, don't read into that. I'm not advocating that you guys stop in the middle of your fight and say, hey, could we video this just to save it or share it with the world? Don't do that. You, you don't put your dirty laundry out there for the world. But I do want to kind of debunk the myth a little bit this morning that if you just had our life, and that's kind of what we portray, if you had our life, then it'd all be peaches and cream. If you had our life, our home, our marriage, our precious children. Because, here again, let's talk about the kids for a second. You put their accomplishments on social media. You, you, you put the, not those moments where your teenager walks through the, 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 the room after you've told them to do something for the 3,745th time, and they roll their eyes, you say, roll them again on Amen, parents? That's not what you're putting on there. Oh, look at little Jimmy. He got on a roll. He's a punk. Sorry, son. You get the point that it's, it's just not always gee whiz and hallelujah. I've, I've told this story before, and I don't know if I told it here, but I have told it that first year in ministry or pastoral ministry, um, we were at Split Log Baptist Church, the only other church I've pastored, and we had about a 45-minute drive one way, and we were living in Exeter, Missouri, which is our hometown at the time, and, and uh, we did that for a year, and it was some of the most interesting days of our life. That 45-minute drive, now mind you, I'm, I'm a man of God, okay? Did y'all hear what I, I'm a man of God. I've got to stand up before the people of God in the house of God, open up the word of God on God's day. And she has the audacity to do anything other than just sit in my presence. We had some of the biggest knockdown, drag out fights on that drive. If we weren't fighting, one of the kids was puking in the car. Because it's curvy roads. More than once, now... Do not write me a letter about this. More than once, they, they'd made such a mess in the car, we threw out clothes and, 
and car seats and everything else in a ditch to pick them up later that night whenever we came home because I couldn't stand the stinking smell. But we'd fight and scratch and claw, and they're just, I mean, there's just a few times I just like, woman, I'm going to jerk it into a guardrail if you don't hush up. It was intense. But we'd pull up into church, and some deacon come over and try to open up our door, and immediately we'd get out, glory, isn't it good to be in the Lord's house today? As though we had just been humming do, Lord, all the way there. What were we doing? Trying to say, if you only had what we have. Truth be known, if they had only known what we have, it might have scared them to death. Point me, guys, it's not always easy. It's not always glamorous and glorious. We've all got sticking points, and we've all got tubes, and we've all got warts and pimples and Issues that we don't want the whole world to see. Well, we're going to expose a little bit of that as we walk through our series called Family Life. Because I think we ought to be real, amen? We ought to be real about the fact that we all struggle. And so what I'm going to do is through these next four weeks, I'm going to give you a component of family life. Really a a picture of family life that I think would serve us well uh, to adapt if we want to be a family that honors Christ. The first one that we're going to look at here today is a loving family. Uh, And really, we have no better example of what it is to to love someone or be a part of a loving family than Christ, even as you see in verse 2, where he laid down his life for us. So I want to speak to you about three different things that I see in the text. You say, why three? Because I'm a Baptist preacher. That's all I think in this three. If I saw a car wreck this afternoon, there'd be three things that would stick out to me about it. So today, I'm talking to you, three things I want to mention that I think are pictures of how we go about being a loving family. Number one is that we are called to imitate his love. You say, well, where'd you get that? Well, look at the text. I was really creative. Therefore, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. Simply put, there is no way, no way possible to imitate the love of God for our family without dying to self. That's why Christ came. He came to die. He came to die for us. And when we examine what's being said in the text, we find that to be true. He died for us. And so before we examine him and what he did, I want to first put a little bit of a light on us. Because don't miss that. He died for us. Well, who is the us he's talking about? Well, it must be good church folk, right? It must be the good church folks that are always sweet and kind, pay their bills and and, and, and bless everybody, right? Isn't that who he's talking about? It must be the kind of church folk that have wonderful marriages and beautiful children uh, and, and have, have never uh, used a cuss word, never even probably even thought a cuss word. That's how holy they really are. Well, not according to the Bible. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Galatians 5, Paul writes these words describing us without Christ. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revel. Sounds like a Baptist business meeting, amen? And a like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you, In the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is who Christ died for. People who were doing this. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And listen to it, listen to it. Because some of you will immediately dismiss on, praise God, I'm not that. Listen to what he said in verse 11. And such were some of you. Such, in other words, he's saying, please don't come talking about you really had something to offer God. This is what motivated him to the cross. No, what motivated him to the cross was his love for you. But I love this part. Whenever he said, and such were some of you, he said, but you were washed. 
but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. The Bible is explicitly clear in who the us is. In Romans 5, it says, For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Enemies of the cross. Well, now, preacher, hang on a second. I thought this was a family series. Well, it is, because reminder, we're called to imitate the love of Christ. You see, what I'm trying to do is to say is that when we begin to imitate the love of Christ and we use that in our home, I'm telling you, there's nothing more transformative in your marriage or your relationship with your children or your parents than to imitate the love of Christ. Here's why. It will compel you to love them when they are nasty. And I know all you romantic husbands, my wife's just never been nasty before. Give her time. They all got it. Now, us men don't, but you, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I just want to see if you're still awake. Thank you, Elvick. The, the point being here, church, is that when we begin to see others through the lens of Jesus, in other words, he sees us not of what we once were. He sees us, if, if we are unsaved, unchurched, he sees us as what we could be. If we are followers of Christ, born again, we see, he sees us now in the, the image of Christ. When we begin to see our spouse, our children in this light, here's what happens, and we love them accordingly, we begin to love like this, and it brings, again, harmony and joy in the home. It's my goal through this series is I want to help to strengthen marriages and try to bring about peace and harmony in the home. And it's not just this facade that if we'll just ignore issues and we'll just act like nothing happened, that's not the point. The point is to love them whether they deserved it or had it coming. If we're waiting until they had it coming, hey, praise Jesus, he didn't wait. But he went to the cross when we were at our worst. So often we, we're held up with this mindset of a wait and see. What do you mean wait and see? Well, I'm just going to wait and see how they respond here. I'm going to wait and see how he acts. I'm going to wait and see what she does. I'm going to wait and see if she's nice. I'm going to wait and see if he's going to be lazy. I'm going to wait and see if their attitude's right. I know no, none of you have ever done that right. I'm going to wait and see. In other words, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to base my attitude off of their attitude. I'm going to base my act of kindness off of their act of kindness or their attitude. Can I remind you, love is always the initiator. Love's not waiting. Love's not saying, I'm going to camp out and see if they've, what the, I'm going to see what you've got coming. Just, just hang on. Love is always the initiator. So we imitate the love of God, but we also are called, number two, to walk in love. To walk in love. You see it there in verse two. Where'd you get it? And walk in love. I'm pretty original today, huh? As Christ also has loved us, given himself for us an offering, a sweet, or a sacrifice to God, a sweet smelling aroma. One of the, I think, most significant ways that we can die to ourselves and choose to love our family members is when we love them uh, the way that they enjoy being loved. You say, well, well, what do you mean by that? Well, we often, our default setting is, is that we love others like we love to be loved. It, let me illustrate. Do you, are you familiar with Gary Chapman's five love languages? Raise your hand if, you've, if you're familiar, at least at some level that. Good, a good number of you. If you're not, you really should be. Gary Chapman, years and years ago, uh, wrote this book called The Five Love Languages. And basically, he's just saying that we're all hardwired with uh, a way in which we view the world, a way in which we uh, express and receive love. And here, here's the five categories he gave. One of them was receiving gifts, one is words of affirmation, one is acts of service, one's physical touch, and one is quality time. Now, also, just as a disclaimer, that, that just because you have one of these right now that's your primary love language, they can morph, they can change over time. Mine has. Um, my, mine's changed, matter of fact, pretty drastically from when 
Bets and I first got married. But the thing that I, I pulled from this whenever I had studied this years ago and certainly here again this week was that if you would begin to see those, those love languages as real languages, it helps us to realize there's some times that we really think we're communicating with our spouse or, or even take a step further, even with our children or parents. And we're doing what we think is our best, but it's just not translating. So imagine that, that receiving gifts, though that's, that's English because, well, that's my number one gift and I'm thinking it's the best, right? Shouldn't everybody express their love through giving of gifts? And I just, because it always irritates me, Christmas comes around and folks are like, well, let's just don't do gifts. I'm like, are you kidding me? Man, buy some more, I'll take yours if you don't want gifts. I just think it's a cool thing. It's a way that you can express, say, I was thinking about you. I, I know you didn't have it coming, okay, but I love you and I wanted to express this to you. And it's the way you do that. Another would be the, the, the words of affirmation. Some folks just got to have somebody saying, add a boy, add a girl. But imagine now that that's Spanish. Another one is um, acts of service or personal touch. Well, let's just say that's Mandarin Chinese. Now, here I am, an English speaker. I'm going to go try to speak my wife who speaks Mandarin Chinese. And I'm working hard. I'm trying to say, honey, I love you. I love you. But I'm speaking in English. And yet the whole time she's looking at me going, why is he sweating? Why is he so worked up? And I'm like, I'm trying to tell you I love you. It's not getting there. And here's why. Because I've made it about me. It's one of the quickest ways for us to hijack, derail our, our marriages, our relationships in the home is to make that about you. You don't always get to do it the way you want to do it. You don't always get to express it the way you wish it was expressed to you. The quickest way that we can bring about here again harmony in the home is that we begin to live for him and others rather than me. But we got to get over ourselves to do it. We got to get past this idea that this is about my fulfillment, it's about my experience, it's about my happiness. And the moment we begin to see that if I'm in Christ, that I now live for him and others, that I begin to live in such a way that Christ is my fulfillment. Christ is the one that gives me that which I need. And so I don't give based upon the fact that I've gotten from you. I give based upon the fact I have everything that I would ever need in Christ. There's a misunderstanding, huge misunderstanding, especially in marriages, about this idea that our spouse completes us. That is nuts. They do not complete. No, you, they complete me. No. That may fit well in our culture. It might look good on a card. You might make a cool video uh, to put on the twit. But, but it, it, it's not biblical. Y'all with me? It is not biblical. Let me tell you what's biblical. I am complete in Christ. I'm complete in Christ. The moment that I start saying to my wife, you complete me. I'm only half a man without you. Listen to me. I have just now placed her in the position of Jesus in my life. It's not fair to her. It's quite ridiculous towards me. And it's a slap in the face of Almighty God. Now, do we help meet needs? Do we help to, 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 to make one another better? Absolutely, heavens yes. But to put that weight on them that I'm not, I'm not half of what I should be without you, 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 you can, it's just simply, it's not a biblical position. When we begin to love them, listen to me, in their language, because I'm concerned more than them. And, and guys, listen to me, and gals, you really need to study them. Study them. I, I've said for years, you, you need a PhD in all things your wife, men. What things does she like? What things does she love? What things irritate her? What things make her mad? What things make her want to throw a skillet with hot grease in it at your face? I know I say, we don't have a violent home just because you're all wondering. <laughs> this is some illustrating, all right? I know some of you are like, bless God, she's about to kill him. 
Well, she dreams of it most days. Um, but here again, we come back to where I was at a while ago. One of the great hindrances for us is that we often are saying that, well, I'm going to wait for you to, to do that. And let me, I'm going I'm to pick on you girls a little bit. I got girls, hang on, because I'll pick on the guys throughout our series too. I, I want to I wanna at least kind of make an awareness of this with you. One of the things that over the years that I, I've, I've experienced as a pastor, I, I've just watched and watched and watched so many ladies that are saved, filled with the Spirit, love the Lord, uh, but a husband that's not. He may be saved, but if he is, he's at least lazy, and he's doing nothing in regards to uh, being the man of God he needs to be. And so don't take him to church, not involved in things of God, and, and, and I'll hear that lady say, well, it's his job. He's the leader, so we ain't going to do nothing. So I'm just going to, you know, drink, smoke, and cuss along with him. Stop. Just stop. I, now, 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 before I go further, I'm never going to advocate, ladies, that you usurp authority over him. I'm never going to advocate that you take his role. But here's what I am going to tell you. The most mature one in the room will be the initiator of spiritual things. I'm letting that kind of marinate with you. If he's not, you do it. It might be that which would spur him on to stepping up and doing it. But to sit back and say, well, we're not going to do that. And then maybe to, here again, I've just, I've witnessed too much over the years. Where she would be upset and say, well, bless God, we've not prayed one time in our home the last 35 years. As though she's better than him. I'm like, ma'am, what's your problem then? Should he do it? Absolutely. Absolutely. But if you've waited 35 years, he's probably setting a pretty good pattern. He ain't going to do it. Point being, maturity just like I said earlier with love, will compel us to initiate it. If you see something needs done, step up and do it. Don't wait on the other. Here again, this is about getting beyond yourself for the sake of the home. It's got to be a lifestyle, not just an event or not just a moment. Let me give you this last one. We'll we'll wrap up and go eat some Mexican food. Doesn't that sound like God's will? Number three is to be Committed to authentic love. Authentic love. You say, well, what do you mean by authentic? Well, anytime you hear the word authentic, you know that there's a counterfeit, right? This is what Paul does in this letter here in these few verses. And I'm not going to read through all them again uh, because they're quite depressing. But Paul essentially is laying out that this is what it is to go after a counterfeit love. He talked about fornication and, 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 and covetousness and all these kinds of things. This is a... Uh, a counterfeit to, to love. In other words, people get involved in this, thinking that this is a this is how you express love. Oh, I'm uh, just so uh, filled with with passion and desire over this other guy that I'm not supposed to be in a relationship. No, that's not love. That's that's lust, and it's dirty. It's sinful and shameful. And what Paul's saying: Don't get caught in that trap. Why? That's not how Christians live. That's not how followers of Jesus live. He's saying, don't sell out for the counterfeit. There's something authentic. Well, what is it? Glad you brought it up. Here it is. 1 Corinthians 13. Here again, St. Paul writing this letter. Now, this text in 1 Corinthians 13 has been taken out of context as much as any in the Bible. Okay, uh, It's really was he was dealing with a Corinthian church in the context of the church because they were hating one another and rude and nasty to each other. And he was trying to explain this is what love is, but it's certainly applicable here for us today. And I want to read this to you, and I just rarely ever do this, but I want to read this to you out of the message, okay? The message is, is, is kind of a paraphrase, but not really even a, a paraphrase of the Bible. But he just is this, this guy's view of Scripture, and I thought it said it well. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, here's how he wrote it. He said, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for itself. Love does not want what it does not have. Love doesn't strut. I like that one. Love doesn't have a swelled head. It doesn't force itself on others. It isn't always me first. 
It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel. It takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. It puts up with anything. Trusts God always. Always looks for the best. Never looks back, but keeps going all the way to the end. Paul said, that's how you love. We want to be a loving family. I've shared with you how. This is how you do it. Listen to it again. When it says suffers long, that's talking about commitment. I get that it's not romantic, and I I would not encourage you men to use this as part of your romantic love letter to your wife. Sweetie, marriage has been so wonderful. I have suffered so long. In our culture, it wouldn't work. Matter of fact, there is some good stuff you can say if you go to the Song of Solomon, praise God, that'll make you and her both blush when you type it out. But that's not it. What he's talking about, though, is something that is quite practical. Love suffers long. It's, it's, it's about toughness and some, some grit. It's about commitment that I'm not quitting. That's a beautiful thing. Can I just tell you, every marriage that makes it to 50 years, 60 years, and and beyond, every one of them have had moments in that marriage where they had to decide, not because they felt like it, but because they had decided to trust God, I'm not quitting. All of them. It says that it's kind. That means it behaves like Christ. Describing love for you, it doesn't try to match the other one. Well, they're a jerk, so... Bless God, that's freedom for me to be one. Well, guess what that means? You're both jerks now. Being kind doesn't do it. It doesn't envy, meaning envy desires to take away from somebody for its own good. You get that right? Envy is a really heavy word. It's not just that I don't want you to have it, but I don't want you to have it so I can have it. It says it's not, it doesn't parade itself, it's not puffed up. That means it, it eradicates pride. By the way, that's what most of our, our scuffles are over, right? Pride. Not willing to say I'm sorry, not willing to hear the other person out, not willing to see the other side. I laugh because it's, just, it's still funny to me all these years later. Bets told me several years ago, she said every time we fight, she said you're always defending yourself. Well, you're not going to. Amen? Of course I am. Well, why are you defending yourself? Because I'm right. If, I don't have, if I'm not right, I'm not going to argue. I argue because she's wrong so often. And yet, seemingly, we're harmonious in that because she says the same thing about me. But here's what, here's what this means whenever it says that it doesn't parade itself it's not puffed up. It's, it's not saying or it's saying that I'm not better than you. You see, so often whenever we attack somebody in our home, whether it be our spouse or our children, what we're saying is often, not always, but often, I'm better than that. I'm better than you. I, I wouldn't have done that or I would have done this. Love is not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. There's no place in the home to be a jerk or jerkette, girls. Love doesn't seek its own. It's looking out for others. It's not provoked, cool-headed, not hot-tempered. Why? Tempers have caused more grief in homes than you can shake a stick at. I don't know where that saying came from, and I don't know why people shake sticks at it, but you got what I said, right? My dad says that. You could more, that, that dog's got more ticks on him than you can shake a stick at. Anyway. Our tempers cause us a lot of grief. And by, and by the way, can, can I tell you, the mature, listen to this, this is good. The mature one is the one that can control himself, not control and manipulate others. That's worthy of saying again, isn't it? Wasn't that good? The mature one is the one that can control himself or Herself, girls, I always leave you out, don't I? That can control herself and not the one that can control others. It thinks no evil. Golly, we could spend the day on that. What does that mean? It means can't keep a record of wrongs. 
Well, they've hurt you before. I know, but I'm a forgiver. Well, yeah, but they've done it twice now, three times now. I know, but I'm a forgiver. How many times have you sinned against Christ? We keep short accounts. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity, meaning it doesn't revel in others' grovel. When they're down, we don't kick them. It bears all things. It means it doesn't quit no matter what. I'm just not bailing out. Talk about something that would change a marriage to say, hey, you are safe in the fact that I will never leave. Irregardless of whatever, I'm sticking around to work it out. And by the way, that will even change how you fight if you have that agreement with each other. Because we don't wind up talking about divorce every time we get in a little tiff. And by the way, if divorce is an option, it will always be one of the first options thrown out. Because it's easy. It's a, it's a cowardice way out for us. That's why I said marriage is tough. You've got to have some toughness to make it. It hopes all things. That means it trusts God and is always looking for the best. And then lastly is that it never stops. It keeps going all the way to the end. Actually, I skipped one. I, I'm glad I did. Here it is. It believes all things. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that we're naive? No, it means that we believe the best about them. Sometimes, and I know what I'm about to tell you, you can't relate with, so you just have to put up with it. The preacher's family's weird. Sometimes in my home, we are, there's no other way to say this, we're a little bit hair triggered. Do y'all know what I mean? What a hair, any gun people know what hair trigger is? Like, you know, some guns when you shoot them, it's just like you really got to pull the trigger. And then others, it's like you could just like breathe on the trigger and the thing goes off. We're sometimes hair triggered in my family. Now, we don't mean to because we're good Christians and we love everybody, right? And puppy dogs and apple pie. But sometimes something as, as just as simple as a look can kind of set us off in my home. Got any, any look fighters out here this morning? You, you're just going to leave preacher up there like, well, we haven't ever sinned. Uh, just sometimes that things are just a little bit edgy and one of us can kind of walk through and just kind of look at the other with that eye. You know that stank eye? Like, why'd God make you? You know, and it's on, Jack. I mean, it's, it's on. It, it, we don't, you don't have to provoke us. You don't have to say nothing. It's like, what's your problem? I love this one. Nothing. Any nothings out there? Amen. I'm happy. Well, bless God. Listen to the text again. Love believes all things. It believes the best Here's the thing, we're all going to have our moments. We're all going to have our challenges. But church, if, if we can learn to even start, let's just start there. I'm going to believe the best about you. Partly what that does is says, I'm going to, I'm going to refuse to be offended by you. You may work at it today, because sometimes we just kind of do it for sport, I think. We've not got an agreement on that, but sometimes we if, I'm just going to not be offended today. I'm going to smile. Now, sometimes we'll smile at each other and irritate each other through smiling. Why are you so happy? Here's my heart through all this. I, I want to be biblical. I want to, I want to give you a picture of love. I want to give you a picture of the family. But I also want to be real. It ain't going to do you any good for us to gloss this over and say, oh, look at this wonderful American dream family. We've got a white house, white picket fence. We've got a dog, 2.5 children. You've got like half a kid. It's just, it's just beautiful. She wakes up early, makes biscuits and gravy. He eats that every day and still loses weight. I'm not going to help you with any of that mess. But I'm going to be real with you through it. We, Bets and I struggle. We just have days where it's hard. And then we have days where, and I, and I always talk about all the bad stuff. I have days, I'm just telling you that, I can't catch my breath for thinking of how blessed I am to be married to that woman. I'm telling you, and I'm not just trying to 
blow smoke at her. That's not who I am. I can't believe I got to marry her. I, she, she, she means everything to me. And yet, maybe within an hour, it's like, Lord, do you want her? So we're going to be real. But my goal with all this is that I want you to be real. I want you to be honest. And I want your home to have some harmony. I want your, I want your kids to grow up in a home that they can't wait to come back to when they get out. Mom and dad, you're the ones that set the tone for that. How you love your spouse. The greatest thing I can do for my kids is to love their mama. It really is. And so I think we'll give you the biblical tools through this series and what we'll do at night time. Um, Let me clarify that since we're talking about marriage. What we'll do in our gathering tonight at Marriage After Dark will help you um, have the tools to to navigate through this. Let me me give our invitation today with this in mind. I'm going to go back to where I started. The greatest thing you can do for your family your marriage, your relationship with your kids or your your parents is to be a better Christian. Please hear what I said. Be a better Christian. So often we're frustrated because of what everybody else is doing and it may very well be that the best contribution I have to give, I'm not giving because I'm not serving Christ. I'm not pursuing Christ. Well, you can. 